We'd like for everyone to keep continue to keep sending cards to Jason Wilkins. Uh, his address is in the bulletin as well. Um, he's having a hard time, uh, you know, just coping with everyday life uh, and, and likes the cards that he's been getting. So do, let's keep up the good work and continue uplifting him if we can. Keep him on the right track. I'd like to thank Pam for July's bulletins. Pam, you're doing a super job with that. In this morning's uh, worship service, uh, Brother Joel Foster will be uh, having our song service as well as our lesson this morning. Uh, scripture reading will be by uh, Brother Vernon. Uh, closing prayer will be by Mike Brown. And we'll begin our service this morning with opening prayer, and that'll be with Bonnie Miller. Almighty God, Jehovah, our Father in heaven, we want to extend all glory and honor unto thee, Father. Mm -hmm. Appreciation for the first day of the week when we can come together to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We want to exalt thee in our lives. Always put thee first. We're so appreciative of the mercy that you give ended to us in the giving of thy son as a sacrifice on our behalf. When we take the Lord's Supper, we want to remember the sacrifice that he made. Without the shedding of his blood, there would be no hope for us. Marvelous, wonderful gift. And he did it for you because of the love that he has for us and for our fellow man. We're so thankful for the gospel that is recorded in my word that through proper obedience to the gospel, we come into contact by our actions that are derived from the gospel. We're covered by that blood. And that our sins were washed away. We choose not to willfully sin against the <coughs> to commit any sin. But because of the weakness of the flesh, we falter sometimes. We do not mean to do this. We're thankful for that forgiveness. But when we repent of the things that we've done wrong, we ask that it put a pure heart to forgive us. You are faithful to thy word that those sins would be blotted out and never be remembered again. We're grateful unto thee for this. Without thy son, we have no life. It's the only life to have. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from thee. And we're thankful for the life that we have in our Son. The glory and the honor that we receive from thee for being thy child. We're so thankful for it. We're appreciative for you do not expect us to be perfect, but to be faithful. And help us to always be faithful unto thee, Father. That we never lose sight that you are so far above us, that you are not like mankind. They expect perfection out of everything that we do. But you are merciful and kind and gracious. And you will always keep your word. always been the same and will be throughout eternity. We 
look forward to that day for us. And all this will be behind us. And we get to see thee face to face. And be with thee in thy Son and the Holy Spirit forever. It all will be perfect peace and joy. And all the sorrowful things that happen to each and every person in this life will be no more. We wish that all men everywhere would come unto thee in faith and render obedience to the gospel, especially the sign of the cross of Christ. That all men everywhere, every human being could be with thee in heaven, but we know that that word teaches that's not going to happen. And it's so sad because you've given us free moral agency. We have a right to choose what we want to do. And men in that last great day will grieve greatly because they chose not to obey thee. But we're thankful to thee, Father, that we've been able to see the truth of thy word and of a free will. We choose to obey thee in all that we do. We're thankful for every person that has rendered obedience to the gospel. And we hope that they always remain faithful. For there's no other life, Father, and never will be on the side of thy Son. And this day, Father, as we've come together to worship thee, we pray that you will accept our worship and you will be glorified. For it is our duty and our responsibility, and it's what we choose to do to glorify thee in all that we do. And we do it in the name of thy precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> One, three, four. One, three, four. <coughs> then camped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle in the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall begin, before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes.
This morning we take of the bread and the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' body and his blood that was shed upon that cross, that he did, did in remembrance of him. If you would, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. 
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had sucked, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We'll know how to pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us now as we're about to partake of the bread which represents Christ's body on the cross. May we as Christians partake of it in a manner well pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll continue in prayer for the fruit of the vine. That's right. Grant our Father, we have more peace this morning to give for us to the other one. Take his cup, cry, sad, and give us a hymn. Remember that day, which died at cross. We pray, amen.
concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is given back to the Lord as he has prospered each and every one of us with. If you would, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures. I'll read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, and it reads, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in storage. God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And also 2 Corinthians 9, Verse 7, it reads, Every man according as his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. We'll now have a prayer for all. Oh, my kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to give back a portion of what God has given unto us. Let us all do this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Two six six. Two six six. Love with everlasting love. So let thy grace that love to know. Gracious spirit from
Six five five. Six five five. Eight six one. Eight six one. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name. Moses, beginning in verse 18. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name. The Lord and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for my child, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory pass, passes, I will put you in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So good to see everyone that's here this morning. <clears throat> we do have quite a number that are on the road, so keep them in your prayers. July 4th last year, I spoke to you, and chose to do a hymn study. You know, I'm basically a song leader, so uh, I sit down and look at the messages behind many of the songs that we sing and uh, thought we would do that again today. In fact, this is going to be kind of song week because we have a hymn study this morning 
we are going to do a singing uh, lesson tonight with some scripture readings, and then Wednesday night is our singing night, so we will be involved in that. Now, that's not taking up time, which we sing to teach and admonish one another, so it's a very important part of our worship. And that's one of the reasons why I like going in and doing these hymn studies because we dig into the songs and understand the messages that are being presented. A lot of times we just sing, sing just to be singing. Uh, I know when I was first starting out as a song leader, I would just sit down and pick a bunch of songs at random, and, uh, not really think about what I was putting together. But as time has moved on, I realized the importance of it and try to tailor those songs to fit the lesson. This morning, we're gonna take a look. <coughs> Excuse me. I've had a little bit of a cough this morning, so I, even though I took a cough pill, so uh, I apologize for that. We're gonna take a look at the song, A Wonderful Savior, I believe it's number nine in our book, and uh, break it down and see the messages that are contained therein. The song was written <coughs> by Francis Jane Van, Van Alleystein. You would know her as Fanny Jane Crosby. Uh, she is a prolific songwriter that lived from 1820 to 1915, almost 95 years. She was about a month short of 95 years. She wrote 30 of the songs that we have in our hymn book it is by far the largest number, the, the, the writer that wrote the largest number of songs that were selected in that book that you have in front of you. And you'll notice that she was blind in the photograph. She has her uh, dark glasses on, but she was born March 24th, 1820 in a town called Southeast. Putnam County, New York. It is in the southern, south, southeastern tip, the next to last county in New York. Um, at six weeks old, she caught a cold. The country doctor misdiagnosed it. They created a mustard plaster put on her eyes because her eyes were infected. They became inflamed, and by the time she was five years old, she had had um, um, scars, so much scar tissue on her eyes that she was blind from that point for the remainder of her life. Um, her grandmother, however, spent a great deal of time reading the Bible to her and preparing her for life. She had a landlady named Miss Holly. Her dad passed away when she was about a year old. She had a little bit of a hard time as she was starting out. But the landlady, Miss Holly, worked with her and she memorized through with the assistance of Miss Holly about five chapters of the Bible each day. This helped her to develop her memory. You know, we talk about how when we lose one sense, another sense tends to take over. This is what happened there. And she, and she developed a remarkable memory. Twelve years old, she entered the New York Institute for the Blind. She went through school, this was a turning point in her life. She went through school and she became a teacher there after she uh, finished school and taught for 23 years at the school. She was a poet. She wrote many secular songs, that's basically what she started out doing. And then she became a prolific hymn writer. Um, in March 5th, 1858, she married Alexander Van Alleystein. That's the reason why I used her married name when we began. And she, uh, he was also, had been a student at the school and was a teacher at the school as well. He was uh, considered the um, most prolific or, or the best organist in New York. And she was also, of course, a musician playing the piano and the harp. And uh, she would play uh, classical music, re 
religious music and ragtime. And it was said that she would sit down and, in her later life and would play many of the hymns uh, in kind of a ragtime style as she got older. She was so prolific as a hymn writer that she wrote over 8,000 songs. Uh, and the editors of the hymn books would be a little bit uh, hesitant to put half of the songs in their book written by the same person. So she went under over 200 pen names. I had a list of them, but I didn't uh, bring the list to show you. Uh, some of the names, but she used as many as, as 200 different pen names. In fact, she was, and, and she said that she wrote up to seven songs a day. And she was such a, can you imagine trying to remember 8,000 songs? It said that more than once she heard a song perform or sung, and she would ask where that song come, came from, who wrote it? And they would say, why well, you did. So she uh, kind of it's something I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have any misunderstanding why she would reach that point. She died at age 94 on February 12, 1915, just shy of her 95th birthday in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Now, the composer of the music was William James Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick. He lived from 1838 to 1921. And uh, he was born February 27, 1838. There's some dispute of that. Some of the articles I read said that he was born in Ireland and <coughs> shortly later moved to Pennsylvania. Others say he was born in Pennsylvania, but he was born to Irish parents. His father was a uh, musical teacher. And so he learned music from his father and also took studies from other individuals as well. He was trained as a carpenter for three years, was in the furniture business for 15 years, but after that he decided that music was his calling and he spent time doing that. In fact, even while he was doing that, he kind of sidelined, uh, side business was music. His first composition was published when he was 20 years old and he re re released his first editorial work. He was an editor of song books. In fact, he was associated around 1907 with the Gospel Advocate Company and helped uh, uh, edit a, um, a uh, hymn book that was released by the Gospel Advocate Company in 1907. He compiled over 60, 60 hymnals uh, in his lifetime. He wrote about over 50 songs, uh, the words for it, but he was very prolific as a composer and composed over 1,100 songs that were published as well. In fact, in our book, he might come in as number two because there's 20 songs in our book that he was associated with either the writer or the composer. He died on my birthday, of course, several years before my birthday, but he died on September 29, 1921 at his home in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. George C. Stebbins, in his book Reminiscences and God Reminiscences and God Reminiscences and Gospel Hymn Stories that was released in 1924 said that he died suddenly uh, at his home in Germantown, which was outside of uh, uh, Philadelphia. His wife found him about 4 a.m. fast asleep in his chair in his favorite chair, so that uh, they thought at the time. Uh, but of course he had passed and at his feet was found a manuscript that had a note at the top said 9:29 2 a.m. so just before he passed he penned these words uh, he said just as thou wilt lord this is my cry just as thou wilt to live or to die i am thy servant thou knowest best just as thou wilt lord labor or rest just as thou wilt lord which shall it be life everlasting waiting for me or shall I tear here at thy feet, that just as thou wilt, Lord, what air is me? So he was, as we say, he was a, a, a prolific writer as well. The song, A Wonderful Savior, basically suggests that Jesus is our Savior. 
and he bestows through the things that he has done for us and the things that he continues to do for us, numberless blessings. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Isaiah's prophecy of Jesus says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this word wonderful that appears in this statement, in the King James it has a comma between wonderful and counselor. Other versions put it together as one word or one phrase. But it comes from the Hebrew word pele, which in strong says marvelous thing, wonderful or wonderfully um, is the thing. But the thing that we need to keep in mind when we say wonderful counselor is that we're not just considering the many works that he did, uh, the things that he did while he was on the earth, but his very existence. John chapter 1 telling us that he was always there from the beginning. The Word, calling him the Word, says the Word was with God. The Word was God. Verse 14, that he became flesh and dwelt among men. He was poured out, made a little lower than the angels. This in itself is a wonder for us to consider. So we need to keep that in mind as we do that. So let's look at the verses here for a few moments. Verse 1. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He came, his specific purpose in coming to the earth was to be our Savior, to atone for our sin. In fact, Gabriel, when he was speaking to Joseph, when Joseph was considering putting Mary away, said, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. H. Leo Bowles made the statement, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. This name means the same as Joshua means, which is deliverer, savior. The Jews had been looking for an earthly kingdom. This was a thing that they had looked for for thousands of years. But Gabriel specified to Joseph that that was not to be his mission. His mission was to establish himself as the Savior to those that were willing to obey, to believe, to penitently repent of the things and become his people. And he came to make atonement for those sins, as we talked about this morning in the class that he and as Barney mentioned in his prayer that he came to the earth and died so that he could cover our sin even though he was not was sinless in himself he'll provide a refuge for our soul as the verse continues there uh, in, in the, it continues in the language and Vernon read the scripture from Exodus that God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock for protection just as he did so our souls will be provided that refuge will be hidden in Christ Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 Paul said for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God and Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 I am crucif been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now uh, life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. And Crosby states in her writing there, she says our, uh, that uh, implies that our lives can be filled with rivers of pleasure as a result and we can rejoice in the Lord always as Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 states verse 2 the wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord he taketh my burden away he holdeth me up and I shall not be moved he giveth me strength as my day this was the second purpose that she talks about that uh, that Jesus came to the earth to take away our burden Think about what David said in Psalm chapter 38 and verse 4. How overcome he was with his sin. 
He says, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. And our burden is the same. It is too heavy for us to bear alone. But Jesus, in Matthew chapter 11, made the statement beginning in verse 20, 28. Come to me, all you who all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Continuing in Hebrews chapter 2, the Hebrew writer there states, beginning in verse 14, since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear and death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus helps us to bear that burden. And by remaining in Jesus, we can... Uh, we don't need to be moved away. We can be stayed in our hope of salvation. Colossians chapter 1, beginning verse 21, Paul said, And you who were once, once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and that which I, Paul, became a minister. And he states that the song states that Jesus gives us the strength that we need for our days. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning verse 10, Paul says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing in him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Moving on to verse 3. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns, and fills with his fullness divine, I sing in my rapture, O glory to God, for such a Redeemer is mine. Filling us with divine fullness. James tells us in chapter 1 and verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from God above, coming from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow doing due to change. A tremendous blessing that we have realizing that God does not change. We don't have to worry about him changing the rules down the road because the rules have been established. And if we follow him and we obey them, we will receive that blessing. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. These blessings include the grace that he has offered to us because we don't deserve the blessing that we receive. But, and the truth that can fill us with his fullness. John chapter 1, as we spoke about a moment ago, beginning in verse 14, talking of Jesus, it says, John says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as of the, of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then he refers to John the Baptist. He said, John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I, as I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. <coughs> grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. As we'll get into in a moment, Moses was placed in the cleft of the rock so he was shielded from seeing God and, and uh, suffering that consequence of that. He said, we then can sing with rapture and give glory to God for such a redeemer. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, one of the scriptures that we refer to about singing. Um, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And in verse 14 through 19 of chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, <coughs> so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all full, the fullness of God. Finally, verse 4 states, When clothed in his brightness transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation is wonderful love. I'll shout for the millions on high. This is an allusion to Christ being clothed in brightness at his transfiguration. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 3, Mark there tells us that his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And this is the same thing that is referred to often in the book of Revelation about uh, Christians being clothed in the same, the saints being clothed in the same manner. And one of the statements made in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5 says, The one <coughs> who conquers will be clothed thus in a white garment, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. In chapter 19 and verse 8, it refers to the bride of the lamb as was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And at the close of that verse, it talks about uh, meeting him in clouds of the sky because he will come in cloud just as he went up. In Acts chapter 1, uh, when the uh, 150 were standing there looking into heaven as he ascended, two men appeared near them and said, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He joined with the millions, shouting his perfect salvation. Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, says, And when he had taken the stroll, the stroll, the four living creatures of the twenty-four elders <coughs> fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain, and... By your blood you ransom people from for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them say to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the chorus winds up and says, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life with the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. This is an allusion to uh, what Vernon read us there in verse 22, which uh, in Exodus, which Moses stated, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. God there, in that case, was protecting Moses from himself, that he would not be consumed by his glory. And this cleft brings an idea of protection and shelter. Now, a writer applies that to Christ metaphorically, and I think she intended to compare Christ to being, uh, being hid in his shelter in a dry, empty, and famished land um, that we would be protected from the turmoil of the world. But when we look at the, that, what Moses was actually talking about, that God was protecting him from, from himself, and I think in some ways it would probably be better for us to think of us of it in that terms because 
We are hidden in the cleft of the rock. Jesus protects us with his hand, protects us from God. Because if we were to fall in the hand of God without hope and without salvation and without the, the, uh, the forgiveness that we obtain through the blood of Jesus Christ, it's an awful thing. So I think that also applies to us. So with those thoughts, number nine in our book, let's sing that song and think about the words and the things that we've just looked at as we go through this song. Nine. It's convenient we ask you to stay. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft, the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And sing that song to think about some of the things and we'll encourage you to break in to some of the other songs and look a little bit at the depth of the meaning of those songs. Now it would be remiss if we did not offer the invitation to those that need to respond to the invitation for those that have not obeyed. Those words are meaningless. <coughs> so the scripture gives us a way that we can be covered, that we can be <coughs> Uh, in the cleft of the rock, covered by the hand of Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. John 8 verse 24 tells us that we must believe or we will die in our sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3 tells us that either we repent or we perish. Matthew 10 and verse 32 it tells us that if we will acknowledge Christ before men, he will acknowledge the Lord and Father in heaven. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when the folks asked, when they were cut to the heart and asked, what should they do? 
Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And of course, we must remain faithful, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, in order to uh, receive that, uh, that blessing in the end. And if you have fallen away or you need the prayers of the church, whatever your may, need may be, we ask you to come while we stand, while we sing. There's a fountain for each is for you and me. Let's be so this morning and we hope that you'll be back with us this evening at five for our evening worship service uh, tonight this time we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer let us pray our precious heavenly father we want to thank you for this opportunity that we get to assemble in that household of faith once again this day we ask father that you would be with each and every member that attends this service and you strengthen them and the songs that we have heard and the message that we've also heard. We ask, Father, that we will apply this to our everyday lives and be stronger from it, Father. And we ask that each and every one of us to share this with someone this week as we go into our work week. And Father, we ask you to be with the ones that are sick and that was on their list this morning that was announced and the ones that we don't know about, Father. We ask that you will heal them and we, if it's an extra phone time, they may be returning to our services again. And Father, we ask that you be with the ones that are traveling, whether we know about or not, they will be from this congregation. We ask, Father, that you will <laughs> bless them and take care of them to, to their destination and Take care of them throughout their journey and bring them back in a safe manner. And we ask, Father, that you will be with us as they come back the next holy time. And we pray, Father, that you will give us more wisdom and knowledge to continue serving in this congregation. And we ask, Father, to forgive us our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Work at all the numbers for me.